Greetings in our Lord's name. I'm Michael Bourne. Now, today I'd like you to turn with me uh, to a famous part of the Scriptures, to John's Gospel, chapter 3 and uh, verse 1. Now, when legalistic religion envelops anyone, breaking free from it takes courage and determination. So the account of Nicodemus that we're going to look at now, this high-standing Pharisee, this uh, member of the ruling council, secure in his Jewishness, coming to Jesus at night, is amazing. It must have taken enormous courage to risk his reputation, although coming by night would hopefully mean that no one saw, but you couldn't be certain about that, could you? But what was driving this man? What was making him come? What was burning in his mind and heart? There is a spiritual magnetism about the Lord Jesus, isn't there? The crowds were drawn to him and said that no one ever spoke like him. Ever since, men and women have been drawn to him when they really look at him. Some years ago, a classic scholar was asked to translate the Gospels. He was not a believer. His son was. Someone said to his son, what's your father going to do with the Gospels? And the son wisely replied, what are the Gospels going to do to my father? And the impact was overwhelming. He was knocked out by seeing Christ in them, and he wrote in his foreword, These documents bear the seal of the Son of Man and God. Out of the Scriptures he was drawn to Jesus. Another writer was asked to produce a series of plays about Christ some years ago. She read the Gospels through more than 30 times, and she was transfixed by the person of Jesus. She then wrote, Christ was no household pet for pale curates and... I'm sorry about this, pious old ladies, well you can put pious old men like me, but God made flesh, a shattering personality. That was the magnetism of Jesus as she read the Gospels. Even those who try to denounce Christ are actually fascinated by him or they wouldn't try and denounce him. And it's true of those who mock him or ridicule him in plays or musical theatre. They keep coming back. He is magnetic. And this magnetism affected Nicodemus. He must have listened often on the edge of the crowd, mustn't he? Perhaps critically at first, but gradually realising, as he says in verse 3, that Jesus was a teacher sent from God. For he says, no one could do the miraculous signs you are doing if God was not with him. He rightly saw the miracles as signs. He discerned God was in this. He was drawn to Jesus. Actually, he says, we know. Who was the we? perhaps some of his fellow Pharisees, possibly, but they didn't have the same courage or determination to find the truth. They played safe, kept their heads down. But those of us who have the task of preaching or teaching need constantly to check whether we're lifting Christ up as first and foremost, whatever theme we may be tackling. It's only as we do that that people will be drawn to him. They will not be drawn by our personal musings on world affairs. John 3.14 here says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, which with John, as always, will have a double meaning. First of the cross, but also of our proclamation of it. It is Jesus we all need to look at and draw people to look at. And yet for most people, Christ is seen first in believers who live close to Christ. How often have I heard outsiders trying out a church service and then say, these people have something I haven't got. And they begin to see Christ as a result. When I was working at All Souls Langer Place, uh, during that time there, uh, there was a great event in London called the Festival of Light. It was uh, an event when Christians gathered from all over the country in great crowds, first in Trafalgar Square, which the, we uh, overwhelmed and went out onto the streets. Uh, about uh, the moral state of the nation and so on, and uplifting Christ. And then we marched through the streets to the big Hyde Park in London. The atheists turned out, and agnostics, to mock us, and they certainly did in some abusive way. One man who went there was a brilliant atheist. He was a man who was uh, uh, one of the leaders of our major publishing companies, incredibly intelligent. <clears throat> he went there also, uh, to abuse or attack the Christians. But what he found was that as he did so, they met him with love. He was absolutely knocked out by it. 
that they met him with love. It chinked his armour. Fortunately, he spoke to someone in his office, and this person in his office uh, gently pointed him uh, actually to All Souls for a Sunday night service. He came. There was an elderly lady sitting next to him who couldn't have argued the gospel with him, but she had her antennae up. She was alert for Christ. And she said to him at the end, because he realised something was happening in this man, she said to him, can I get you a cup of coffee? And she got him a cup of coffee and then ran for help. He came to Christ. And on the Wednesday I saw him. He was already advancing fast. He said, can I have some books to read? I gave him six. I saw him the next Wednesday. He'd read all six. This brilliant, intelligent man, he became a tremendous Christian, was brought through by Christians showing Christ in the love they showed against the attacks. So uh, if uh, someone listening to this, and you're like Nicodemus or Alan, and over recent weeks or months, you've been shaken in your non-belief and drawn towards Christ, be like Nicodemus, be like Alan. Seek help privately, secretly if necessary, perhaps seeing a pastor or Christian friend. Fear of reputation is nothing compared with the need to seek the truth, as I've seen so many do. Until you come to see and accept Christ as your saviour, and then know the liberation of faith in him, it will be life-changing, it's worth everything. So how did Christ respond to this seeker? Well, he sees right into him, as he always did, uh, with those he met. When we're trying to help others at this point, we need primarily to pray for discernment. We need to learn how to speak with half of our mind and pray with the other. Better still if someone comes to pray with us. We need to discern what is the root blockage. It's not always the surface reason. For Nicodemus, it seems he just wanted assurance that he was really okay. Christ instead removes his false confidence so that he can find true assurance. What was the blockage? It was just this. The Pharisees' teaching was that if you were born a Jew, note the word, if you were born a Jew, you were set for the kingdom of God through resurrection on the last day. Full stop. No problem. All neatly tied up. Just keep the rules. Of course, some of those rules were a bit ridiculous. They went to extraordinary extremes, like the one about the Sabbath, that a woman shouldn't look into a mirror on the Sabbath because she might see a grey hair and be tempted to remove it, and that would be work. So they got loaded with all sorts of extra rules. But keep the rules and you're okay. So the reason Jesus uses the term born again, and we use that a lot, but the only place it was said to anybody was here, uh, to Nicodemus. It goes to the jugular. And the reason he uses it, because Nicodemus thought by being born a Jew, he was okay. So Jesus says, truly I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless born of water and the spirit. Nicodemus' security is blown to pieces. For many whom we meet, the block will be a version of science has disproved the Bible, or if there was a God of love, he wouldn't allow suffering in the world, or various other reasons. And we need to respond appropriately to show the fault in their thinking and to show, for instance, a true view of the relation between science and scripture, or to show what the love of God really means, rather than some grandfatherly, grandfatherly make me happy view of God. This is the only place in the Bible then when born again is used in this, in this way. The truth is expressed elsewhere, as it applies to every believer, uh, whoever we are, but Jesus never uses the actual terminology to any others, because it's tailored to the block in Nicodemus. Every inquiry needs to be heard from where they are and answered from that starting point. Saying you must be born again to everybody is not Christ's way. So he uses different terms to the rich young man, to the young, to, to Zacchaeus, uh, to the woman in adultery, to the man low to his feet in Peter's house. He meets them where they are. Now Christ, Christ opens up this truth of rebirth. There's a totally new dimension of the spirit that Nicodemus has got to discover. Verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, and spirit gives birth to spirit. Until we turn to Christ, we are spiritually dead. I love the story of a military colonel who was uh, invited to a posh lunch, uh, uh, and uh, he found himself sitting next to a bishop, and he was horrified. 
So he thought he'd settle it straight away and he turned to the bishop and said, I don't have anything to do with all this religious stuff, bishop. And the bishop effectively replied and said this, what do you mean, colonel, is you're not all there. Well, I don't expect the colonel liked that, but he was on target. We are made by God to be alive physically and spiritually. And so we're not all there until we're spiritually alive. Thus, we all must be born again to enter this wonderful God-intended dimension of life. But when we're reborn, we then enter the kingdom. We are to live the kingdom now, not after death, as Nicodemus would have thought. So another correction to Nicodemus is wrong thinking. John doesn't use kingdom much just here and before Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. But in the other Gospels, it's a recurrent theme. Uh, and so we have uh, the good news of the Gospel. We are to pray, your kingdom come. We are to seek it first. It is like the sower, the mustard seed, yeast, treasure in a field, a merchant looking for a pearl, and a, a net let down in a lake. All sorts of wonderful descriptions of the kingdom that we enter when we're born again of the Spirit. So born-again Christians should be living this new, this new kingdom dimension. Thus being born of God, the words used in 1 Peter 1, 20, 23, means we should live lives of love and truth and purity and so on and crave for the truth of his word. And in the other use of born of God in 1 John, it means lives that are lovely and holy. Thus the circle is complete because as believers truly live the kingdom, others see Christ and are drawn to him. How can this be? That's Nicodemus, very practical, verse 9. The answer is clearly given by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Only then do we have eternal life, only then are we reborn. We can't rebirth ourselves any more than we can bring ourselves to birth humanly. But the Spirit breathes into us a new life, a new dimension, ongoing work of transformation and understanding and love. Turning to Christ and rebirth may be sudden or it may be gradual. We don't have to know the date of our birthday to know we're alive. But it is for real. Earlier John spelt it out in John 1.12. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So we turn to Christ. We are brought to life by the Spirit. We become there and then children of God forever. It's wonderful, isn't it? Did Nicodemus do that? Well, in John 7, he speaks up bravely in the Sanhedrin, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? Later in John 19, he helps Joseph of Arimathea to bury the body of Jesus and to anoint it. So I guess he was a secret believer, but a believer. And the real question left now to ask is, are you someone who knows the, the rebirth of the Spirit has happened in your life? Or is there a need, however short, or long you have been going to church, to seek help, to be assisted in truly accepting Jesus as your saviour and believing in him and coming to know the rebirth of the spirit. It may need swallowing of pride, it may need courage, it may mean you could just jolly well ignore what other people think, but it's the most important issue facing any human being. For when we turn to Christ, the clouds will lift and the spirit will bring you into this new dimension forever. You will at last be there and rest in the glorious truth that follows in this gospel. In chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That includes you and me when we believe on Jesus and are thus born again. Thanks be to our amazing God.